Good morning, everyone. My name is Erin Kopech, and I am with Extra Help, a workforce management resource. Today, you have joined us for our Workplace Excellence webinar entitled Sales Tax, What You Don't Know Can Hurt You. Brenda Kelly will be introduced and begin momentarily. The Workplace Excellence webinar is an exciting program for our clients and colleagues to help manage their workforce changes and increase workplace efficiency. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. This call will last about one hour. You are set up as a caller in listen-only mode, but you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, you should have a questions bar at the bottom of your GoToWebinar screen. Feel free to type in questions um, as they come about, and, but we will be facilitating those um, for Q&A the last 10 or 15 minutes of the presentation. So let's get started. Brenda Kelly is a partner of Fontaine & Kelly LLP, a state and local tax consulting firm with a nationwide client base. The firm provides multi-state strategic sales, use franchise and income tax planning, analysis, and compliance assistance. Brenda was previously the Director of Compliance for the Missouri Department of Revenue from January 1991 to December 1993. Ms. Kelly is a member of the American Institute of CPAs and the Missouri Society of CPAs. Brenda is also a certified member of the Institute of Professionals in Taxation and is chair of their Sales Tax School Board. So now I turn it over to Brenda. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you could understand or from the bio that uh, Aaron just read, I do have previous experience with Missouri Department of Revenue um, where I was in charge of about 250 sales and use tax auditors and we audited for Missouri sales tax purposes across the United States. Um, after I left the Department of Revenue, I actually went to um, work for a multi-state consulting firm out of Austin, Texas and there I was able to um, have some experience in dealing with sales tax on a multi-state level. So uh, my experience comes from both sides, and I'd like to share with you today some things that um, I've learned through the last 20 or 30 years of how sales tax can hurt you if you don't know certain aspects of it. Um, Aaron, I am not having the ability to change this screen. All right. There it is. There you go. Okay. So... Um, sales tax is actually a tax uh, that was imposed first by the state of Mississippi. They had the first statewide sales tax. Now, 45 states plus the District of Columbia have a statewide sales tax. But in addition to that, there are about 7,500 localities, cities, counties, um, library districts, transportation districts that have a sales tax as well. Um, and that can cause some challenges. The states that do not have a sales tax Alaska, a statewide sales tax is Alaska, Delaware, Montana, New Hampshire, and Oregon. So let's talk about what a sale is. So we have to know what a sale is before we can understand what the sales tax applies to. And a sale is simply a transaction that results in the passage of title or possession or both of tangible personal property from the seller to the buyer or which results in the provision of a service in exchange for consideration. There's a lot of key terms in there that I want to go through and make sure we all understand. First, you have to have the passage of title or possession or both. We're familiar with the concept of passage of title. A um, good example is a motor vehicle. Um, or, but when we look at possession, you can have where I, am, I can go buy a copy machine from someone and I can take over possession of that copy machine. But I can also lease a copy machine. And if I do that, I have possession of it as well. And almost every state that has a sales tax on the sale of an item also has it on the lease of the item. The next key term we have to talk about is tangible personal property. The sales tax applies to tangible versus intangible. So we're talking about uh, tangible typically means something that you can see, touch, taste, feel, or otherwise perceptible to the senses. Um, but many states have expanded that to include such things as saying electricity is perceptible to the senses because it will shock you if you stick your hand in a light socket. 
um, say computer software is perceptible to the senses. Some intangible things that are typically not subject to the sales tax are stocks, bonds. Um, and then we also talk about personal property versus real property. Personal property, uh, things that I personally own, that um, my couch, my desk, but real property is typically considered real estate and most states do not tax, impose a sales tax on the transfer of real estate. Most of the time the sale, we're used to the sale being on the transfer of title of, um, of tangible personal property, but it can also be imposed by many states on the provision of a service. Now the last phrase in this definition, in exchange for consideration, is important as well. Um, when we have consideration, typically most people think that means cash. I am giving you cash or I'm giving you um, currency and you are getting, I am giving that to you and you are giving me tangible personal property and that's what causes the sale. But consideration does not always have to be in terms of um, currency. It can be barter. I give you a desk and you give me a computer. In most states, that will be subject to sales tax as well. Um, it can also be you assume my debt. So I sell you a copy machine, but instead of giving me um, cash for it, you take over any payments I need to make on that copy machine. That is also considered a sale in most states. So one of the things I want to make sure everyone is aware of is even though most of the states have a sales tax, um, there, and we can talk about general rules of sales tax all across the United States, there's very few things that are definite that all states do or no states do. And I'm going to next talk about four different types of sales taxes that you find across the United States. Um, there's very few that you can say a state is always one particular kind or has all the characteristics of that kind of a sales tax, but this just gives you some general ideas. So the first type of sales tax is a seller privilege tax. And typically what the seller privilege tax um, is the tax is imposed on the seller for the privilege of doing business on the state. It's not imposed on the purchaser. It's not imposed on the transaction. It's imposed on the seller. A state that has a seller privilege tax is California. Um, I'm here in Missouri. Missouri also has a seller privilege uh, tax. But just because the tax is imposed on the seller doesn't mean that the purchaser is not liable to, it, to pay the seller the tax. The state may not be able to recover the tax from the purchaser, but the seller typically by contract can recover it from the purchaser and remit it to the state. Most of the time in a seller privilege state tax, you do not, um, the seller is not allowed to say, oh, I will pay your sales tax for you. Not always true. There are some exceptions to that. But in general, um, I as the seller have to separately state and show the tax um, on my invoice. The next type of sales tax across the United States is a consumer levy tax. And it is a tax that is imposed on the buyer, the consumer, but it's a debt of the seller, and the seller is typically required to collect the tax. Many times, um, if a state imposes a tax, a consumer levy tax, then the seller usually is compensated by the state for the administrative burden of collecting and paying the tax. Most consumer levy states require the tax to be separately stated on the invoice, and that the seller cannot say that they're going to pay the tax on behalf of the buyer. Mississippi is an example of a, sell, of a consumer levy state tax. The third type of sales tax across the United States is a transaction tax. This tax is imposed on the transaction. And so since both the buyer and the seller are equally liable for the tax, the state can actually um, audit either buyer or seller to collect the sales tax. Texas is an example of a transaction tax state. Again, most of the time, the tax has to be separately stated on the invoice. Um, one of the unique things about a transaction state uh, sales tax is that both the buyer and the seller have the ability to ask for a refund of the tax if it was paid erroneously. 
And the last type of sales tax we have in the United States is called a gross receipts tax. And as the name implies, it actually applies to the entire gross receipts of a business. So every dollar that comes in um, is typically considered subject to tax. New Mexico and Hawaii are example of gross receipts tax states. Um, a funny note about Hawaii is Hawaii actually taxes the tax you collect. So the state tax rate is 4%, um, but the effective tax rate is 4.16% because Hawaii taxes the tax as well as all the other gross receipts that the company receives. So as I said, there's no hard and fast rules across all the states but there's some generalizations that we can look at um, that are consistent with all four types of sales taxes. First, as a seller, you should assume that everything that you sell is taxable. Um, every piece of tangible personal property that is sold, you can assume is going to be taxable in every state. You should also assume that everyone is taxable. So every single person that you're selling to, in general, um, any sale made to them is subject to tax. Now we might find that there are certain states, or states legislatures have passed certain exclusions or exemptions saying that in this instance, for example, if I'm going to buy something and I'm going to turn around and resell it, most states have a resale exemption. Um, but it's a burden on the purchaser to prove that they are going to resell <clears throat> that item in the normal course of business. Um, the third thing that you should assume is that all receipts are, are taxable. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, all receipts are considered taxable, meaning it doesn't matter if the tax that, or the money that I'm receiving as the seller is because of the sale of the item itself, the desk, um, or if it's the installation or the assembly of the desk. The basic rule is to assume all receipts are taxable unless you can find an exemption or an exclusion in the state statute. The other thing is sales tax typically applies only to the transactions within that state. So a state can tax a sale from one city to another city or a sale that's happening within the same city. Most of the time, a state cannot tax a transaction that crosses the state borders. So I'm in Missouri. If I'm making a sale into Illinois, most of the time, uh, if title transfers in Illinois and not in Missouri, I cannot tax it in Missouri. doesn't mean that it may not be subject to tax in Illinois, it's just Missouri can't tax it. And the last is, as I said up earlier, you're supposed to assume all sales of tangible personal property is taxable. Most states, services are only taxable by exception. Um, unless it's a gross receipts tax state. So what I mean is, if you're talking about a professional service, unless a state has specifically said that they're going to tax professional services, most states are not, then that service is not going to be taxable in that state, unless it's a gross receipts tax state. There's also some other caveats as far as services are concerned. If a service is necessary to the completion of a sale, you can't actually buy the tangible personal property, Without the provision of service, most states are going to tax that service as well. So let's talk about some issues in interstate commerce because there's a lot of selling back and forth across the states. As I said, states cannot typically cross borders to tax. Um, most of the time, sales that are in commerce between one state and another are not taxable in the state of origin, my example earlier in Missouri, but they may be taxable in the destination state, my example, Illinois. Purchase is in interstate commerce, so I'm uh, buying something and I'm buying it from a seller in Illinois. So Illinois seller may not be able to charge the tax, a sales tax, but I as a purchaser in Missouri am responsible for paying a use tax based on where the um, goods are going to be ultimately used, stored, or consumed. One of the key issues that causes a lot of problems in interstate commerce is the concept of nexus. And we're going to talk a lot about nexus in a little bit. And it, it essentially determines when a seller has an obligation to register and collect the state sales tax or use tax. One thing that happens 
a lot of challenges is multi-divisional, multi-state corporations can have large nexus problems. Um, you can have activities from one company, one separate um, legal entity that can cause nexus for another legal entity. Okay, before we get into ne nexus, I've mentioned several times um, this term use tax. And every state that has a sales tax also has a complementary use tax. Most of the time, the use tax is imposed on purchases that are made outside of a state and used within a state. Uh, whether it's buying mail order, whether it's buying over the internet. Um, and typically, you will have a use tax when a seller, a consumer's use tax, when a seller is, doesn't have sufficient nexus to require them to register to collect the tax, but the purchaser is still storing, using, or consuming an item in that state, and so they should be paying a consumer's use tax on that item. So important things to remember about the use tax. It's the liability of the purchaser. You are the one who is purchasing something. The, sales, the seller did not charge you tax, but you're going to store, use, or consume that item. You have the responsibility to pay a use tax, a consumer's use tax in the state. One thing a lot of people don't realize is the consumer's use tax applies to individual consumers as well as it applies to businesses. So if you're buying, if you bought a lot of things off of Amazon over the Christmas holidays, and um, Amazon was not registered to collect tax in your state, then you have the responsibility to accrue and, you, and remit a consumer's use tax to the state where you live, where you've used those items. Um, one other time that you can have a use tax situation is, I mentioned earlier you can have an exemption called a sale for resale. Most states will not tax something until it is the final transaction. I am buying it from my supplier. I'm going to turn around and sell it to my um, ultimate customer. I typically would buy from my supplier tax-free, claiming a sale for resale claim, and I would collect tax from my buyer and remit it to the state. But there are times that I may have purchased something tax-free, but I end up not actually ultimately selling it to somebody else. I use it myself. For example, I might have a grocery store, and um, I happen to notice that my front windows are very dirty. So if I take some cleaning solution and paper towels off of my grocery store shelves and I use them to clean my store windows, I am no longer um, have those available to resell those items. So I have to accrue and pay a use tax on those. Mostly I've been talking about consumer's use tax. The purchaser buys something and they are using it themselves, they have to uh, pay a tax. Um, but there are some states that have something called a seller's use tax or a vendor's use tax or a dealer's use tax. And these are, happen whenever a business might have sufficient nexus, connection with the state, to require them to be registered to collect the tax, but they don't have an actual business location, an actual storefront in a state. Um, in that case, many there are some states that will require the sellers to collect a seller's use tax as opposed to a sales tax. Where this can be important is um, in some states the tax rate may be different whether it's a sales tax or a use tax. Usually any exemption or exclusion that pertains to the sales tax um, generally will apply to the use tax. And this is a big area um, of audit findings. So many businesses have a pretty clear understanding if what they're selling is tangible personal property, that they have to collect the tax on those items. But they may not fully understand that if they are purchasing something that no tax is charged on, that they have the responsibility to accrue and remit a use tax. So it can be an area of large audit findings, and it's strongly recommended to get your use tax records in order before any audit would begin. As I said, there's over 7,500 taxing jurisdictions across the United States. Most are administered at the state level, but there are some states that have um, that are called home rule states or home rule jurisdictions. And in those locations, um, Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Louisiana, you have a situation where the city and or county have determined that they're going to administer their own taxes. 
So for example, in Denver, Colorado, if you ha um, have a location in Denver, you would be registered both at the state of Colorado and in the city and county of Denver. You would fill out two separate registration applications. You would file returns to two separate localities, or two separate uh, tax administrations, and you might be audited by two separate um, entities. Where most of the states that have home rule jurisdictions, they follow the same rules as far as the state, as far as what's taxable and what's not. But um, that is not always true, and Colorado is a prime example of that. You'll see Alaska is on this list, and um, earlier I said Alaska did not have a statewide sales tax, which is very true. But Alaska has um, home rule uh, city and county sales tax that people need to be careful about. Okay, so governmental agencies can do a lot of things. Um, one of the things they can do is they write rules and regulations. The state legislature will enact uh, a taxing statute. But they might do something very um, generic, saying that food is, uh, prepared food is going to be taxed. Well, what is prepared food? So a state uh, regulatory agency will try to um, take the intent of the General Assembly and to clarify, to give examples of what is and what isn't taxable. Um, so businesses can have a better understanding of the proper way to collect the tax. A uh, state agency will also grant time extensions. I think I recently saw that with the snowstorms in the Northeast, uh, Connecticut has just extended when their tax return is due. They issue forms. They tell businesses uh, what type of documentation that they need to retain, uh, what information they have to give the state on a registration application. They audit a business's records, and if they determine that a business has not um, collected the correct amount of tax or paid the amount of tax, the correct amount of tax to the state, they will issue assessments, um, and they will hold hearings where the taxpayer can give their side of the story as far as whether something should or shouldn't be taxable. Um, and many government agencies have the ability to abate interest and or penalties. Most of the time, they're very stingy about in abating interest. But if you can explain reasonable cause, you might get them to abate a penalty. So when do you have to register in a state? The main time you need to register is if you're making sales in that state, uh, typically sales of tangible personal property, maybe the provision of the service, depending on the type of service that you're, you're um, providing, and whether the state has decided to tax that service, um, or if it's a gross receipt state. Uh, so you're making sales in the state and you have nexus with the state. So we've talked about this term nexus a lot. Nexus simply means a connection between the company and the taxing jurisdiction. Is there a sufficient connection there that the state can impose a tax directly on the business or can require the business to register and collect tax from its customers? So there's been quite a few United States Supreme Court decisions that have talked about when someone has enough of a connection. And in general, the United States Supreme Court has said that a business has to have a physical presence in a state before there is sufficient nexus to require them to collect the tax. So typically, if all a seller is doing is making mail order sales or selling something over the internet, and they are going to deliver, have those items delivered via the US Postal Service, or a common carrier, FedEx or UPS, many times if that's all a seller is doing, he's not going to be respi required to collect tax in the state where his um, customer is located. But if you have a situation where the seller is, uh, has an office or has, has a storefront in the state, okay, that typically, yes, you will be required to collect the tax. Um, you will need to register with the state. So if you have property in the state, most people are familiar if they actually own a business uh, you know, or have inventory in the state, that that might be sufficient connection, uh, nexus, to require a business to register and collect the tax. But one thing that a lot of people don't think about is even if you have leased property in the state, that can be uh, sufficient connection. And it can really trip, trip up 
someone who is leasing property close to the state line. For example, Kansas City, Missouri, um, if I have a business in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm leasing a bulldozer to someone, uh, a construction company, and that construction company takes that bulldozer from my location in Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, and takes it to Overland Park, Kansas, which is right across the state line, and uses it on a construction job in Kansas, I now have a connection with the state of Kansas because I have property that I own that is sitting in the state of Kansas, which gives me sufficient connection with the state of Kansas to require me to register and collect Kansas as tax. A seller is also required to collect if they have employees um, or independent contractors or distributors that solicit sales on their behalf within that state. So um, I'm in Missouri, St. Louis, and I have custom or I have employees that will go into the state of Illinois to uh, solicit sales. And if I do that a sufficient number of times, then that will give me sufficient physical presence in this state and require me to collect Illinois state tax. Um, so, and that can be true whether it's my employee or whether it's an independent third party that is just operating as an agent um, or a representative on my behalf that can also create the responsibility for me to collect and remit tax to Illinois. One thing I just said is if I do that enough times, um, it could trigger uh, me to have a collection responsibility. It could be sufficient presence. Um, the challenge is the United States Supreme Court has not really said how many times or what is sufficient presence. They said it has to be in excess of de minimis. Well, they didn't define de minimis either other than to say non-trivial. So the general rule that I tell um, clients is if someone is entering into a different state, you're going to go into a different state to solicit sales. If you're only going to do that once or twice a year, um, most states are not going to push the nexus issue and say that you're required to collect their tax. But be careful, there are some that will. I like to say Texas and Ohio have what I consider groundhog nexus. They take the position that if someone just um, casts a shadow in their state, that is sufficient physical presence to require that seller to collect the tax. The general rule of thumb I usually tell clients is if you have someone in the state more than four or five times a year, be prepared to receive what's called a nexus questionnaire from that state. And that nexus questionnaire is the state's going to say what type of activities have you had in our state and how long have you, how many times have you done that? And some will say that is sufficient physical presence to require a business to register and collect their tax. So we talked about if you had an employee um, go in and solicit sales, something else that will require a seller to collect the tax is if you have an employee that goes in, an employee or an independent third party, go in and perform post-sale training or uh, repair services, installation services. That will also result in a physical presence in the state and the need to register and collect the tax. So the other time that I said you might need to register is if you have been in business in the state, what you were providing was a non-taxable service, and the state legislature decides that's a good service to start um, imposing a sales tax on. For example, many states impose a sales tax on real property services, um, janitorial cleaning of commercial buildings, and some impose it on a data processing service. So you always have to keep track of what's going on in your state legislature to see if they have changed the rules as far as what's taxable and what's not. If you do find that you need to register in a state, typically um, these items are what's wanted on a registration application. They want to know the business name, address, telephone number, uh, first date of business, type of ownership, owner information such as their home address, their social security number. They want to know the federal identification number of the company. They want to know the estimated liability, how much tax you think you're going to collect, what type of thing, product or service are you selling, uh, where are you going to be located, where's your bank. All of these different pieces of information tell the state certain things. I want to bring a couple things on this list to your attention. One is, routine question I get is, 
Do I have to give the state my Social Security number if I'm an owner? Um, many times, if a business refuses to give the Social Security number of the individual owner, the state will refuse to grant a license. Um, they will just reject the registration application. So be very careful if you um, are, have a certain aversion to giving a Social Security number, realize the risk is you may be operating without a sales tax license and that could have criminal penalties as well as civil penalties. The first date of business, the reason the state wants to know that is they want to be able to um, see when they should start expecting sales tax returns from you. This can be really tricky in certain circumstances. It's, if you're just starting a business, you started a business January 1, no, February 1, 2015, not a problem. You put February 1, 2015 on that registration application. The state's going to expect the first return typically to be due in March. But now that you have a better understanding of Nexus, what happens if you're saying, well, really, if I look at my first date of business, I've been going into you know, the state of Texas since 2011. But if you put 2011 on that registration application, you can expect non-filer notices from 2011 forward. If you put today's date, um, you run the risk of potential civil and criminal penalties because most of the time the state registration applications are signed under penalty of perjury. So there's some real challenges in how to complete certain parts of the registration application. Um, if you do find you have got that challenge with the nexus issue, um, I've got a solution for that that we'll talk about in just a minute. I want to cover some various types of registrations you might have, just kind of a summary. We've talked about you get a sales tax license, you register as a seller if you're making retail sales of tangible personal property in the state, or if you're providing a service, a taxable service in the state. Some states require sellers that are only making wholesale sales to also register. Um, the example that I had earlier where someone does not have a storefront in a state, but they do have sufficient nexus in the state, that would requi require the out-of-state seller to register many times for a seller's use tax or a dealer's use tax, but sometimes it may still be called a sales tax in that state. You can also have to register if you don't make any sales, but you do purchase items that no tax wasn't charged on. That's the consumer's use tax registration. You can also have a registration for an exempt organization that may be exempt on their purchases but still have to collect tax on their sales. Another type of registration that many of the states, but not all have, is called a direct pay permit. And that is typically given to a large company that sometimes some of the things that they purchase are going to be tax exempt, either because the state has a manufacturing machinery equipment exemption or a sale for resale exemption. But they're going to have a lot of purchases that may be subject to tax as well because they're going to be the final user and consumer. They're, the state has determined that businesses over a certain size probably have a um, large enough and sophisticated enough tax department that they can determine for themselves what's going to be taxable and what's not. So they buy everything tax-free, and then they determine what's taxable, and they remit the money directly to the state. So if you're not registered or in compliance with the state, what can you do, especially now that you understand that you might have some exposure for prior periods that you were unaware of? Most states have a voluntary disclosure program, and that is a program where a business can um, come forward in a state on an anonymous basis through a third party, um, such as their accountant, their attorney, and you essentially tell the state, these are the activities that my client has had in your state. They did not understand the concept of nexus. They did not know that they should be registered and collecting and remitting the tax, but they want to be a good corporate citizen and they want to come forward and take care of this. Um, most states with a voluntary disclosure program will require the business to pay the back taxes um, and interest for what is considered the normal statute of limitations. So when a business right now is audited by a state, the state is limited 
to a certain number of years that they can look back and review the taxpayer's books and records. Missouri, the statute of limitations is three years. So if you're registered in Missouri and you are filing sales tax returns in Missouri and you have ever since you started, and you started back in 2005, the state of Missouri cannot go back and audit your records of 2005 because there's a statute of limitations of only three years. They can only go back to 2000 and, um, 2012, now that we're in 2015. But if a return has never been filed, then the statute of limitations never runs. And so if you've been in business to, since 2005 in Missouri, and you've never filed a return, and you were making taxable sales, then Missouri could actually audit you back to 2005. However, if you have a voluntary disclosure program, most of the states agree to limit that look-back period to the normal statute of limitations. So that would be the 2012, in my example, instead of the 2005, even though a return has never been filed. Most states will abate a penalty under a voluntary disclosure. But like I said, very few will abate any interest. An alternative to a voluntary disclosure program is a tax amnesty program. Typically, states um, periodically will do a tax amnesty. The goal is to try and collect uh, taxes from people uh, that haven't paid their taxes um, in correctly in previous periods. But you always have to wait on a tax amnesty for a state to announce they're going to have one. The voluntary disclosure programs are available pretty much um, anytime a business wants to try to come clean, quote unquote. So let's talk about some filing and reporting requirements. How often are returns to be filed? You can have returns that are due annually, semi-annually, quarterly, bi-monthly, monthly, and even weekly. Um, so how it's determined how often your return is to be filed goes back to the um, item on the registration application of your estimated tax liability. The more taxes that uh, you are anticipated or that you collect, the more frequently the state's going to want you to file that uh, tax return. Most tax returns are due on the 20th of the month. There are some that are due on the 15th. There are some that are due um, the 23rd, 25th, or 31st of the month. It's, you're just going to have to look at each individual state. Some states, you might have to file a return quarterly, but you might be required to make a monthly prepayment. For example, um, in New, New Jersey, you actually file the return quarterly, but if you collect over $500 of tax in a month, they want the money now, even though they don't need the paperwork until the end of the quarter. Um, you also can have prepayment. California and New York have some significant prepayment requirements that happen, again, on a um, monthly basis, even though the return might be due quarterly. Oh, speaking of that, just to let everyone know, if you're operating in New York, be careful. New York has quarterly returns, but they're an off quarter. So most of the time, you'll have January, February, March that's due in April. In New York, you actually have on your quarterly return December, January, and February, which is due in March. So be careful of any prepayment requirements. States also have electronic funds transfer requirements saying if you collect over a certain amount of money, uh, they want to be paid electronically as opposed to being paid with checks. Sometimes you can trigger an electronic filing responsibility if your sales tax payments are over a certain amount, or you might even trigger it if the combination of your sales tax, your withholding tax, and your income tax um, payments are over a certain amount. There are some states that will only accept um, sales tax returns filed electronically or via the telephone as opposed to your paper return. So be careful of those. As I said, most states require the returns to be done or filed on the 20th. And if it's not filed on time, then you might have uh, penalties for a late file, late filing of that return. Be very careful to know whether the state, if they say the return is due on the 20th, does that mean that it is sufficient to have put it into the post office if you're filing it via paper? Or does that mean it has to be received by the state? Different states have different rules. So we talked earlier about um, 
some items can be exempt from tax. And you can have exemptions based on who the buyer is. You can have exemptions based on what's being purchased. Um, you can have exemptions based on how something is, is being used. Uh, when I used to work at the state of Missouri, the director of revenue said he wanted the auditors to become quasi pilots. He wanted them to take the position that if it was a sale of tangible personal property, that when they went in and audited a taxpayer's books and records, they should either see tax on an invoice or they should see a valid exemption certificate that the business had to explain why they did not collect tax on that transaction. So a valid exemption certificate will typically have the name and address of the purchaser, the seller's permit number, um, or the registration number of the purchaser, the name of the seller, the type of business that the purchaser's in, the type of property that's being purchased, why it's exempt, and then it's typically going to be signed um, at the date of the sale, and it's going to need to be signed by an authorized representative of the business. And if a business takes an exemption certificate in good faith from a purchaser, then that relieves them of the responsibility of collecting tax on that transaction. So not all states, well, there's not one single valid exemption certificate form that is applicable in all states. There are, but there's a, these are the key elements that will be on it. And ju you just need to make sure that most of the time an auditor is going to want to either see tax on the invoice or going to want to see that you have an exemption certificate proving why you did not charge the tax. So let's summarize on some of the issues to consider when collecting a sales tax. Oh, I lost my mouse again. Erin, is there something I need to be doing? It's not letting me advance. Um, there, nothing oh, there it is. Oh, no, I lost it again. Try it again. It's there. It's just grayed out. There it is. Okay. So the first issue to consider is, do you as the seller have a responsibility to collect the tax? Do you have sufficient nexus in a state that will require you to collect the tax on your sales of tangible personal property? Um, it's gone again. Um, the second thing is, is the transaction exempt by statute? Do you have a situation where that state only taxes sales to the final user and consumer? And so they do not tax sales for resale. The next is, is the purchaser that you are selling to exempt? The U.S. government sales directly to the U.S. government paid by the U.S. government funds are typically not subject to tax in any state. But don't make the assumption that just because sales to the U.S. government are exempt, that sales to an agent of the U.S. government is exempt, or sales to a state government is exempt. Um, many businesses have gotten tripped up making sales to the state of California, the, the state itself, the state government, because they assume that any sales to a state government is not taxable, but they are in the state of California. So you have to be very careful about that. The next question is, is the property that you're selling exempt? Many states have an exemption for food for home consumption, but they don't, that exemption does not apply to prepared food or food for immediate consumption. And you can spend days and weeks trying to understand the difference of prepared food versus um, food for home consumption. I was just working with a client the other day. They prepared a juice. They you know, juiced several different fruits together and prepare the juice and sold it in a sealed container. Well, it met the state's definition of prepared food because they combined two or more ingredients, but then it met an exclusion from the state's definition of prepared food because it was sealed. So that can be very challenging. Just as what is manufacturing, what um, qualifies for manufacturing in one state uh, may not qualify for manufacturing in another state. So the next thing that you need to think about is um, how is the tax imposed? Is the tax on, imposed on the seller, as in a seller privilege state? Is it imposed on the buyer, as in a consumer levy state? Or is it imposed on the transaction? It can be important as far as who the state can come to to audit if they don't get the tax that they think they, they are entitled to. 
how should the tax be presented on the invoice? Does it have to show a separate line item for tax? Like I said, most state auditors, what they do is they look at the tax return or at an invoice, and if there's not tax on that invoice, they'll say, okay, where's your exception certificate proving why you did not charge tax on this invoice? What is the tax situs? What's the location of the tax? Some states impose tax based on where the seller is located. Some impose sales tax at the rate in existence where the buyer is located. Sometimes it's based on where the contract was negotiated. So if you can have you know, 7,500 different tax rates across the United States, you can understand why it's very critical to understand um, which tax rate you use. I mean, is it origination or is it in destination or something different? What is the tax rate? You have to combine the state rate plus a maybe a city rate, maybe a county rate, maybe a transportation development district rate. Um, I lived in Columbia, Missouri for a long time with zip code 65203, and I put that in my rate program, and I came up with eight different tax rates for that one zip code because there were many transportation development districts, and it depended on if I bought something from a store in this new development versus a store that had been established in the city of Columbia for a long time. So you have to be very careful knowing what the correct rate is that you're supposed to be charging. How is the tax computed? Remember I said earlier you should assume all the receipts are going to be subject to tax unless you can find an exemption form. Um, some states do not tax uh, manufacturer's coupons, but the, or they don't tax retailer's coupons or store coupons, but they do tax manufacturer's coupons. Some states will tax delivery charges um, if they are FOB destination, but not if they're FOB origination. So you need to understand what is the dollar amount you need to compute the tax, you need to apply the tax rate to once you figure out what the tax rate is. And then some other issues is where is the tax decision made? Is it something that you have a, a computer system that you program and determine what's taxable and what's not and what the correct rate is? Is it something that someone manually uses a calculator to try and figure out? Do you have override keys on your cash register? that where the system might say something is taxable, the taxpayer or the, the customer refutes it, and then your clerk has the ability to override the tax. That can cause some significant issues under audit. You need to think about exemption certificate issues. There's no valid certificate that every state uses, but there's those typical key elements. And what happens if you don't have all of those elements? Could the auditor refuse to accept that exemption certificate? And then the other issue to think about is use tax collection of payment responsibilities. We talked about if you purchase something tax-free and then you consumed it yourself. But you can also have other use tax issues if you are making transfers between jurisdictions. Um, I may buy a desk and use it in my location in Missouri, but I move next year and I go to the state of Texas. Well, I'm now storing and using that item in the state of Texas, and if the tax rate in Missouri was less than the tax rate in Texas, Texas could claim that they should get the additional tax um, based on the fair market value or book value or some other value of that item that I transfer from one location to another. Sales tax is an entity, specific entity tax. So Sales typically between two divisions of a company is just like um, that's going like from my husband and myself. It's just we're the same entity. But if instead it is between two subsidiaries, that's a transfer from one legal entity to another legal entity. So that can trigger some use tax responsibilities. So I'm hoping by just this um, little introduction that I've given you to sales tax, you can understand that um, what you don't know about sales tax can hurt you in the long run. If you do understand a lot of these basic concepts, sales tax should be strictly a pass-through tax. I'm collecting it from my uh, purchaser and I'm giving it to the state. But if I don't understand all the rules or I don't have all the documentation I need, it can really hurt me in the long run. Are there any questions?
All right, if you have any questions, feel free to, to type those in in the next minute or so, and we can answer those as they come in. If not, Brenda's contact information is right there. If you have anything in the future that comes up that you'd like to reach out to her, and check it out. All right, I do not see any questions coming in. I want to thank everyone for attending today and our appreciation to the presenter, Brenda. Um, please join us. We do have a webinar coming up at the end of the month. Um, you should receive your invites in your email. And if you're interested in signing up for our email list so you do receive other information regarding our webinars, you can send me an email at ecopec, so that's E-K-O-P-E-C, at extrahelpinc.com. Looks like we actually do have one question that popped in. Brenda, here's the question. It says, if you sell to an out-of-state distributor, you would create a nexus with that state. However, the distributor would resell, thus would join, thus would be exempt. Would sales tax need to be charged to the distributor? Okay, so that's two separate concepts. One is if you're selling to a distributor and that distributor is your representative in the state, you might have nexus in that state, but everything that that distributor is, is purchasing from you, they are purchasing under a sale for resale claim. So you might have a filing responsibility if the state requires wholesalers to be registered and file, but you would probably have zero taxable sales because all of your sales would be exempt as a sale for resale claim by that distributor. All right, we have just another few seconds if anybody has any last minute questions. All right. Well, thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and thanks again. Thank you.